Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O God, for you are our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Good morning, Cathedral Church. It was a world that had lost its way, the world that was Jesus. For it was a world of far too many beggars left on the side of the road and a world of far too many lepers who had simply been left alone. And so it was a world that was not the way that God would have it to be. And so into this world came the one who said, I am the way, the truth, and the light. Anyone who comes through me will have eternal life. The world that was Jesus is the world that is ours. A world that has indeed lost its way. And so it is that we must ask on this morning, what is the way that is Jesus? What is the way that shows us the way the world is supposed to be? This is a question that is answered for us in our gospel reading this morning, this question of Jesus' way. And so what is the way that is Jesus? It is a way that begins in a Samaritan city. John tells us that Jesus has come to the Samaritan city of Sakaar. Now, even though this city was on the main route of Jesus' travels from Judea to Galilee, he could have and should have, at least according to cultural and religious protocols of his day, he should have avoided it. For there was a long history of conflict between Jews and Samaritans, Moreover, Jews considered Samaritans a ritually impure, if not defiled, people. Therefore, by going into Samaritan country, Jesus placed himself not only in danger, but perhaps most significantly, he placed himself in the midst of an outcast and marginalized lot. And if that was not bad enough, while in Sakaar, he engages in a conversation with one considered the most defiled of all the Samaritans, a woman. For if Samaritans in general were thought to be an impure people, then Samaritan women were deemed virtually untouchable. So much so that men, let alone a Jewish rabbi, was not to speak to them in public, to say nothing of carrying on a prolonged conversation. As for the particular Samaritan woman with whom Jesus chose to converse, well, to add insult to injury, she had at least five husbands, when at best religious law and custom permitted only three. So here Jesus was, conversing with a woman who was considered a pariah among pariahs. Even this woman knew how much of a pariah she was, so much so that she went to the well at high noon, the hottest time of the day, perhaps counting on no one else being there so she could at least spare herself scornful public reminders of her humiliation, if not spare others the awkwardness of having to avoid her. But as fate would have it, she would not be the only one at the well in the heat of the day. For who should we, she find sitting there? None other than Jesus, who was ready to talk. What in the world could Jesus have been thinking? While I can make no pretense of knowing what was on Jesus' mind, as John tells the story, it would seem that while going into Samaritan country was perhaps of little geographical significance, it was for Jesus of great theological, that is, divine concern. For in going there and conversing with a Samaritan woman of ill repute, we in fact discover something about the way of Jesus that is the way that the world is supposed to be. And so, what is it 
that we discover. It seems to me that the first thing that is made clear in Jesus' sojourn into Samaritan territory is that which is in fact revealed throughout his ministry, which is this, that it is to the most humiliated in our world and in our society. It is to those who have been pushed out, marginalized, spurned, rejected, if not demonized for whatever reason, it is to them it is to them that Jesus comes. And here's the thing. He comes to them not with an air of superiority or even with a sense of judgment, but rather he comes to them with humility, the humility that is solidarity, a humility that recognizes that he is just as vulnerable as they to the humiliations of an unjust world. In this regard, he is no better than the most humiliated. It is no doubt for this reason that Jesus does not answer the woman directly when she asks him if he is greater than their ancestor Jacob. For it is not the matter of showing his greatness or, that to, or even the matter of his divinity that Jesus has come. Rather, it is for the matter of showing his very humanity a humanity that is defined by his solidarity with the most humiliated of the world. And in fact, it is in such solidarity that his very greatness will be revealed. So what is it about the way of Jesus that we discover through his journey into Samaritan territory? The way that is Jesus is a way of humility a humility that affirms a, sac a shared vulnerability to the realities of unjust humiliation. Cathedral community, inasmuch as our society and our world do not reflect the way of God's that is justice, then we are all vulnerable to the humiliations of injustice. Those of us who are not Samaritans today well, we can be Samaritans tomorrow. As long as there is a single individual that is not free from enduring the humiliations of injustice based on the arbitrary notions and prejudices held against who they happen to be, so that another can enjoy the arbitrary privileges of who they happen to be, then as long as there is one person who must endure unjust humiliations, then none of us, none of us are free from the possibilities of the subjective and random realities that is the power and privilege of prejudicial injustice. To paraphrase the off-quoted poem written after the Holocaust by Pastor Martin New Nymuller, First, he said they came for the communists, then the socialists, then the Jews, then they came for me. Such is the way of unjust humiliation in a world that is not the way of God. And so there was no one who knew this more perfectly than Jesus. For less than a week after he entered Jerusalem, held by the crowd as king, that same crowd chanted, crucify him, crucify him. Yet at the end of the day, all of our humanity is compromised as long as the fortunes and privileges of any of us depends upon the humiliations of others of us. And so it was that Jesus showed us another way of being, indeed another way to be great in an unjust world. And that is a way of humility. Simply put, the very integrity of our very humanity, as it was for Jesus, is defined by the solidarity of vulnerability that we share with the most humiliated of our world, a solidarity that took Jesus into the land of the Samaritans and indeed to the cross, which leads us to another aspect of the way that is made clear to us through the one who went in to the land of the Samaritans. John tells us that upon encountering the Samaritan woman, Jesus initiates a conversation with her by asking for a drink. 
give me a drink, he says. By making what seems a simple request, Jesus is letting the woman know that he feels what she feels. He feels her thirst, a thirst that is about more than the water that comes from the well. He feels her thirst for the sustenance to live the abundant life that God promises each of us, the sustenance which the water symbolizes, the sustenance that is, for instance, caring, respect, relationship, let alone shelter, food, or water itself. What is the way of Jesus in our world? It is the way of the heart. For when Jesus asked the woman for a drink, he is leading not with the rationalizations of his head or with the preconceptions of his day. Rather, he is leading with his heart, the place of empathy, the place of common ground. We, each and every one of us, have a heart. Hearts that hold, if you will, our deepest feelings of happiness and joy, our deepest feelings of pain and sorrow. Hearts that hold the deepest feelings that are the thirst for the abundant life that God promises. And as long as we have a heart, then we have the capacity to enter into the feelings of the humiliated other. For here is the thing, I know this to be true. Each and every one of us at some point in time has felt the pain, the thirst of being humiliated, if just for a moment. And while our minds might forget the particulars of that humiliating moment, our hearts remember how it felt. It is the memory of our heart that will help us to see other people's sufferings like our own. The point is this, we must value the feelings of another's heart the way we value the feelings of our own. What our hearts thirst for, so do the hearts of others. And so it was that as Jesus felt the thirst of the woman at the well, he felt her thirst for more than what comes from the well. He felt her thirst of her heart, a thirst he had entered into. Therefore, he could say to her that if she drank of his water, she would thirst no more. For the water which he gives will quench the very thirst of her very heart, the thirst for the abundant life that comes from God. Church, our world, our society, the way it is, is a world that seems all too often heartless in its treatment of the most humiliated, even as it is a world that humiliates. Yet all is not lost. For we who are created in the image of a loving God, we have a heart. And it is the feelings of our very heart that provide the common ground to a better world. That is a world that reflects the very heart of God. And this brings us to the final aspect of the, la of the way that is made clear through Jesus' journey into the land of Samaritans. In the end, John tells us that a woman who was filled with humiliating despair and thus comes to the well in the heat of the day, perhaps to avoid people, that very woman leaves the well with her thirst quenched and thus freed from her humiliations, and thus able to go out into the midst of people to be for others what she did not have when she came to the well, and that is hope. She goes out into the world as a living testimony of the very hope, the very hope that the world will one day be the way it is supposed to be, a world where there is no one no one who suffers from the humiliations of injustice. When those who are the most humiliated in our world can testify to a hope for a world that reflects the justice, the peace, and the mercy that is God's love, well then, therein lies the hope for all of us. And so it is not incidental 
that in John's gospel, it is the most humiliated of Jesus' world, a Samaritan woman, who is the first to carry the good news of Jesus out into the world. So back to the beginning. The world of Jesus is our world, for it is not the world it is supposed to be, as it is a world where far too many people suffer the humiliations that are ostracizing intolerance, the heartlessness that is uncaring privilege, and the hopelessness that is blind power. Ours is a world that simply does not reflect the love of God that is justice. And it is into this our world that Lent comes. It comes as a time to remind us of a different way of being in the world. This is a way that follows Jesus into the Samaritan countries of our time, the way of humility, the way of heart, the way of hope, the way of the cross. And it is this way, Cathedral Church, that regardless of the boldness of injustice, it is the way that our world is going to be. For the way of humility, heart, and hope is none other than the way of God's heaven. And that way always, always, always has the last word. If you don't believe me, come back on Easter morning. But for now, let us on this third Sunday of Lent, let each and every one of us leave this place with humility, heart, and hope, following the way of Jesus, thus showing our world the way it is supposed to be. Let it be so. Amen.